Chapter 4 Socialism and National Socialism Fascist Socialism The extent to which fascist or national socialist movements were or were not socialist or, in quotations, social, end quotations, is, we have already seen, a vexed one. The critics of fascism generally represent it as the vehicle of nationalist ideology in the service of capitalism. A typical statement of this view appears in John Strachey's The Menace of Fascism, which the British labor leader and future minister published in 1933 after abandoning Mosley's new party. For Strachey, National Socialism is simply a movement, in quotations, for the preservation by violence and at all costs of the private ownership of the means of production. Fascism kills, tortures, and terrorizes in defense of the right of the capitalists to keep the fields, factories, and mines of the world as their private property. End quotation. Two things strike one in this passage. In the first place, the familiar confusion between fascism and national socialism. In the second place, the equally familiar confusion between these movements and reaction. And, since reaction must be defined as the attempt to keep things essentially as they are, or, better still, turn the clock back, preferably to a time before the French Revolution, since reaction opposes progressive or subversive tendencies, black shirts and stormtroopers, Rexists and Romanian legionaries appear in Strachey's book as simple mercenaries in the service of some occult private interest. This was a mistake that true reactionaries like Charles Maras never made. Let us see what another student of fascism, the communist theoretician R. Palm Dutt, has to say on this question. In his Fascism and Social Revolution, in brackets 1934, end brackets, Palm Dutt enumerates what seem to him the outstanding characteristics of fascism, which may be summed up under seven headings. Heading 1. Maintenance of Capitalism. Heading 2. Intensification of Capitalist Dictatorship. Heading 3, in brackets, letter A, end brackets, Limitation and Repression of Independent Working Class Movements and, in brackets, letter B, end brackets, Building Up of a System of Organized Class Cooperation. Heading 4. Revolt Against Parliamentary Democracy. Heading 5. Extending the State Monopolist Organization of Industry and Finance. Heading 6. Closer Concentration of Each Imperialist Bloc into a Single Economico-Political Unit. Heading 7. Increasing Imperialist Antagonisms Leading to War. In brackets, see also reading number 1b. End brackets. On closer examination, we shall find that most of the points which Palm Dutt considers characteristic of fascism apply equally well to communism. Distrust of parliamentary democracy, extension of state monopolies and state organization, the limitation and repression of independent working class movements, the concentration of the Soviet bloc into a single economico-political unit, and the exacerbation of imperialist antagonisms both within and outside the communist world. The maintenance of capitalism and the intensification of the capitalist dictatorship appear ambiguously in the practice of both fascists and communists. The latter, at least for the present, operate on the basis of a vast state capitalism whose dictatorship is total, or, at any rate, totalitarian, while the former aspire to establish and intensify state control over all capitalist interests of any consequence. There remains the building up of a system of organized class cooperation, which is indeed a fundamental difference between the two systems. And there remains, as well, a point that Palm Dutt ignored. Nationalism. One might add, in passing, that neither socialism nor communism is inherently democratic, at least not in terms of constitutional parliamentary regimes based on electoral majorities. A French labor leader and revolutionary socialist, Victor Griffuel, in brackets, 1874 to 1923, end brackets, saw the labor movement as, in quotations, the syndicalist reaction against democracy, end quotation. And it is possible to argue that French syndicalism at least was born from the proletarian rejection of democratic political processes, which they considered heavily weighted against them, as, indeed, they were. It seems, therefore, that, as concerns fundamental ideology, Fascism differs from communism, and from socialism too, by its nationalism on the political plane, 
and by its insistence upon class cooperation on the social plane. Both of these points have long since been adopted by conventional socialist, social democratic, and labor movements in the West, where the essence of socialism is no longer the victory of one class over another, culminating in the dictatorship of the proletariat, but the reconciliation of the proletariat with their fellow citizens in an equalitarian, in brackets, and democratic, and brackets, national community. Writing while his country lay under German occupation, Raymond Aron, a supporter of General de Gaulle, forgot all the arguments of socialist internationalism to remember only the reactions of a romantic nationalism more redolent of Mazzini than of Marx. The French worker, he declared, knows very well that no social progress is possible in a country enslaved and colonized by a foreign conqueror. Patriotism and the hope of social reform cannot be separated. In quotations, these wars of national liberation are true revolutions because they rouse against the foreign tyrant whole peoples united in the will to fight and to be free. End quotation. Such arguments would soon be turned against the French themselves, by other peoples waging their own revolutionary wars of national liberation against them. But they were also easy to transpose into a national socialist context, to which Iran acknowledged no relation and no sympathy. If patriotism and the hope of social reform could not be separated, Hitler and Mussolini found an unexpected place in the great Jacobin tradition, along with the heroes of Valmy, the Communards of 1871, and the Red Armies that responded in 1918 to Lenin's cry that the fatherland was in danger, as they did in 1941, to Stalin's similar appeal. All this is very confusing, and should warn us to go carefully in trying to find a classification for fascism. The most obvious conclusion to be drawn from it was voiced by Kurt Schumacher, the German socialist leader. In quotations, never again, end quotation, he declared after the Second World War, in quotations, will the socialist be caught being less nationalistic than their opponents, end quotation. Some students of fascism seem to have remained with the conservative view of opposition between extremes, which is reflected in the title of a pamphlet of the 30s entitled Bolshevism or Fascism. The reality lies rather in another title, Drieu La Rochelle's Fascist Socialism, which, in an unconventional conjunction, reflects the essence of fascist radicalism. If there is one thing all fascists and national socialists agreed on, it was their hostility to capitalism. In 1936, the slogan of Rex had been simple. Against inhuman hypercapitalism, against profiteering politicians, for bread and dignity, workers of all classes, Unite! Seven years later, de Grel had not changed his tune. In quotations, It is not to save capitalism that we fight in Russia. End quotations. He told the thousands who had gathered to hear him in German-occupied Paris. In quotations, It is for a revolution of our own. End quotations. Rather than see the old regime survive, in brackets, or revive, end brackets, he would prefer the communists to win. De Grel spoke to the crowd. If Europe were to become once more the Europe of bankers, of fat, corrupt bourgeoisies, slack, sloppy, and accommodating, we should prefer communism to win and destroy everything. We would rather have it all blow up than see this rottenness resplendent. Europe fights in Russia because it is socialist. The youth of Europe which has taken up its machine guns will not make the mistake youth made in 1918. It will not exchange its guns for slippers. We are going to keep our chargers, and when we have put paid to communist barbarism, we shall aim at the plutocrats for whom we are saving our last shots. What interests us most in the war is the revolution to follow. The war cannot end without the triumph of socialist revolution, without revolutionary youth stepping in to save the industrial and agricultural worker. We shall never know whether, had the Nazis won, de Grel's dream would have come true the dream of emancipated workers and peasants led by revolutionary youth sporting among the ossuaries and the charnel houses. The thing to note is that these sentiments were expressed by a leading national socialist figure, highly regarded by Hitler and by Himmler, speaking for the SS who would later publish and distribute the long speech, with the most revolutionary statements carefully italicized. Although largely, and often deliberately, ignored, such tendencies had not, in brackets, as we have already seen, end brackets, flared up all of a sudden. The war may well have given them an opportunity for public expression and a hearing that they had not always enjoyed. 
It has generally been argued that the social pretensions of fascists and national socialists and their revolutionary verbiage were mere camouflage for sheer opportunistic power politics, designed most often to preserve intact the essential interests of big money and big business. In practice, and always remembering that only in Italy and Germany did such movements achieve power, and then briefly, the contrary seems to have been the case. Both fascists and national socialists were ready to compromise, come to terms, moderate their language as part of opportunistic political maneuvers. As soon as they could, however, they tried to establish control over the economic and financial interests which they had begun by treating with circumspection. In quotations, corporatism is not, even in Italy, a system for the conservation of capitalist privileges, end quotation writes Manoilescu, and in his Revolution of Nihilism, written to warn the West against what he describes as the truly revolutionary and nihilistic nature of Hitlerism, this is what Hermann Rauschning says, who had been Nazi Gauleiter of Danzig. In quotations, Nothing is more astonishing than the blindness of conservative economic and social leaders, not only in Germany, but everywhere, to the fact that dynamism, whether fascist or national socialist or any other, is revolutionary and that its constructive elements are only in appearance conservative, and in reality work on the strict lines of state socialism, leading of necessity to the expropriation of the leaders of industry and the deposition of the past ruling class. End quotation. In Italy, the fascists moved more slowly, first because the control apparatus of which they had disposed was less efficient, and then because their aims were less doctrinaire than those of the Nazis. The latter had very little time between their access to power in 1933 and the outbreak of war, and this time was devoted largely to establishing themselves in power. The liquidation of SA leaders in June 1934, which seemed to mark Hitler's break with the radical and socialist aspect of National Socialism, was only a maneuver in a greater campaign, a temporary sacrifice made to secure long-term advantages. An illuminating article by A.G. Whiteside, in quotations, The Nature and Origins of National Socialism, end quotations, in brackets, Journal of Central European Affairs, April 1957, end brackets, shows that contrary to Rauschning, some German conservatives at least realized this. Nor did the Nazi rank and file doubt it. As one of Milton Mayer's interlocutors pointed out, to speak of the National Socialist Party was to miss the point. It was the National Socialist German Workers' Party. Another had the same to say. In quotations, it was the Arbeiter, Socialist Party, the party of workers controlling the social order. It was not for intellectuals. People wanted something radical, a real change. End quotation. In January 1939, the British Union Quarterly had printed out, in quotations, a letter by an enthusiastic German National Socialist to a sympathizer in England, end quotation, protesting against allegations that Hitler was no socialist. In quotations, Hitler is a socialist, end quotation, the writer insisted. In quotations, National Socialism, as the name says, is socialism, end quotation. If they were not socialists, it seems at least that this is what they wanted to be. Property the confusion between fascist and Nazi claims of socialism and the indignant rejection of such claims by a more conventional left seems to rest largely on the question of property and what should be done with it. Socialists held, and non-socialists seem to have shared this particular impression, that property was the touchstone of socialism, and all the theorists of fascism and national socialism declared that private property would be respected. They added, however, that property of social significance must conform to the nation's needs, and that it would be controlled and directed to this purpose by the state. In quotations, all property is legitimate insofar as it does not harm the common interest, end quotation, Marcel Diod declared. But, in quotations, as soon as property has a social function, it becomes subject to social control, end quotation. No one is entitled to leave land uncultivated. Managers cannot exercise absolute power over their prices, production, or capital. The nation has a sort of suzerain right over private enterprise. In such circumstances, the problem of management becomes more important than that of property, a fact which most economists have realized in our own day. And the property regime needs to be modified only to the extent that it is called for by the planned economy of the state. 
a Nazi economist explained in a book published by the German propaganda services in occupied France, the question of private property which had seemed very relevant a generation before appeared secondary to national socialists who approached it with the idea that the general interest is superior to the particular interest. For Nazi economic policy, it mattered little whether the enterprise was state-owned or in private hands. The essential was that everyone had to conform to the state's directives. In quotations, for an economy thus directed and controlled, the question of private property, apparently essential in 1918, had since become secondary. End quotations. Towards an organized economy. Thus, Corporatist economists could view a mixed economy with equanimity. For Mussolini, as for Manoelescu, corporatism had no prejudice against either private property or socialization. It was a pragmatic system, which did not set out to impose either one sort of property regime or another. However, it seemed to Manoelescu that, as economic organization progressed, the active economic function of private capital would diminish until its social utility was extinguished significance and power of capital would disappear. This point of view was shared by a socialist economist like Henri Demain, who, in 1934, explained his views to a socialist study meeting at Potigny near Paris. Demain's Plan du Travail, which became the official policy of the Belgian Labour Party, envisaged a mixed economy in which, in quotations, political power would be used to create the economic conditions in which the country's productive and consumption capacities would be adapted to each other. This objective implies a double change in the doctrine of socialization. In the first place, the carrying into effect of a plan on the national plane is no longer subject to the international plane, but takes precedence upon it, which means that nationalization must be the present state of socialism. In the second place, the crux of nationalization is not the transfer of property, but the transfer of authority, which means that the problem of management takes precedence upon that of ownership. End quotation. Although these views came dangerously close to those expressed by corporatist economists, and which Italy and Germany were beginning to put into practice, the plan for French economy elaborated by the CGT, in brackets, the French Confederation of Labor Unions, end brackets, and presented by the Confederation's leader, Leon Juhau, in brackets, friend and successor of Greufels, end brackets, followed closely the lines of Henri de Man had laid down at Potigny. In brackets, compare reading number 5a, end brackets. One wonders how far de Man, steeped in German thought and active in German social democratic circles for many years before Hitler's access to power, had been influenced by ideas of compromise developing in that country, and how far it was, on the contrary, the thought of de Man, which led some German thinkers to emphasize management over ownership. A more general historical explanation, while not answering the question itself, may provide part of the answer. The subordination of ownership to control seems to stem from the attempts of socialist intellectuals to reconcile their doctrines with a less obviously revolutionary platform, and one which would not clash with property interests that even the working class electorate now cared for. After the turn of the century, when socialist parties began to compete for power within the parliamentary system, their collectivistic doctrines could be expressed and applied only at the risk of losing the votes of property owners. As a class-conscious proletarian party, the socialists could ignore this. As electoral candidates in a democracy, they could not. For the industrial proletariat never comprised a majority of the electorate, and small property owners were even more hostile than the great corporations to a collectivism that they interpreted in terms of confiscation and communism. For those who proposed a gradual advance towards social justice by means of constitutional reforms, it became necessary, therefore, to adjust socialist doctrine to the interests and to the prejudices of the electorate for whom property was vitally important. As the socialists became less revolutionary, their electorate grew and incorporated the partisans of moderate reform within the existing system. As their electorate grew and their parliamentary representation with it, the socialist parties themselves became increasingly, in quotations, governmental, end quotations, ready to work with cabinets of other factions and sometimes even ready to form a cabinet themselves. This had notably been the case in France before 1914, and would be the case in Germany, Austria, Belgium, and Britain in the years which were to follow the outbreak of war. It was impossible in these circumstances for socialists to emphasize the apocalyptic theses of their Marxist doctrine. It was equally difficult, however, 
to abandon this doctrine altogether. The theory had to adjust to practice, the more so since socialist theoreticians realized that in an economic structure, with power increasingly concentrated in the hands of few, the economy could be manipulated and directed from a relatively small number of vantage points that controlled credit, production, and labor. Control of capital by a central credit institution which would regulate interest rates and the flow of money, control labor through the unions, nationalize key industries, in brackets, transport, power, and brackets, the foundation or acquisition of state enterprise to serve as guides or checks in other sectors. These would provide the essential means for vaster changes which need not threaten, nor appear to threaten, property as such. The experiments and reforms that all this involved could only, it seemed clear, be carried out on a national scale. If the dream of world proletarian revolution was out of date, the hope of a planned economy on a world scale was as vain. The plan would have to be applied within a closed society, and one as self-sufficient as possible. Socialism would have to abandon its internationalism for autarky. It took some time for such ideas to be accepted. Socialist militants and leaders continued for the most part to repeat the conventional slogans of proletarian victory, with their implications of internationalism, confiscation, and class war. The first to act along the new lines were the fascists and the national socialists, while corporatist doctrine developed from similar concepts. It was the Great Depression, beginning in 1929, that led socialists like Mosley and Demand to take a public stand for protection and national exclusivism. The world economy, based on free exchange, had collapsed. Effective international action to cope with the crisis seemed impossible, and so remedial work had to start on the national plane. But even when official socialist bodies endorsed such views, they found it hard to abandon their hoary class consciousness, and this repelled a portion of the public which might otherwise have gravitated towards them. The economic crisis which turned socialists inwards, towards the nation, had ruined, dislocated, and displaced important sections of the middle and lower middle classes. Deprived of their property and of their previous social and economic associations, many of these people could now be persuaded to consider collectivistic situations that they had rejected earlier. Now that they had no property to defend, the thought of a national community of resources became more appealing. They became more willing to express themselves and to view their interests in national collectivistic terms, which seemed to offer the advantage of both utopia and myth, the promise of effectiveness and the inspiration of the dream. The success of National Socialism in Germany is obviously connected with this. In stressing national unity rather than division into classes, the Nazis harnessed the two great ideological forces of our time. They were not alone. Mosley, Diat, Dorio, and Deman all insisted that the new society must be a society for everybody, that nothing useful could be built on class divisions, that while the revolution was more than ever necessary, it would not come from petrified party mandarins and bureaucrats trammeled by their investment in the existing order, cracked and useless though this order was. The Workers The interest that the new movements showed for the middle classes, and especially for the petty bourgeoisie, has been cited as one more proof of their reactionary nature. We have seen already that fascist and national socialist movements can best be described as populist, but they certainly did not lack concern for the worker. When, in 1919, a group of poor and idealistic students at the Romanian University of Iași founded a movement which they named National Christian Socialism, they agreed that defeating communism, in brackets, by which, especially in the guise of Russian imperialism, Romania felt peculiarly threatened, and brackets, was not enough. In quotations, we must fight for the rights of the workers. They have a right to bread. We must fight against oligarchic parties and set up national workers' organizations which will be able to claim their rights within the limits of the state, not against the state. End quotation. These Romanian sons or grandsons of shepherds, of farmers, and of village priests were unwittingly close to the Russian Narodniks, who had tried to enlighten the peasants, and even to the Bolsheviks whom they bitterly opposed. The first public manifesto that they placed on walls and hoarding of Iash in the winter of 1919 was headed, in quotations, Appeal to Romanian artisans, workers, soldiers, and peasants. End quotation. In Hungary, too, the National Socialist Aero Cross Party, led by Major Ferenc Zlasi, 
preach what Zelasi called, in quotations, a unified socialist community of workers, end quotations. Very little has been written about these movements of East and Central Europe, and even less of it in English. But according to Professor Istvan Dijk's study of the Arrow Cross, a lot of people in Hungary simply thought that the Arrow Cross wanted to introduce socialism in a form befitting the highly nationalistic preoccupations of a country that was passionately interested in revising the peace terms that were imposed upon it in 1919. Talking about another Hungarian leader of the radical right, General Gyula Gombos, who was Prime Minister from 1932 until his death in 1936, Deke remarks on the oddity of a situation in which the forces of the, in quotations, left, end quotations, stood for the maintenance of the status quo, while the forces of the, in quotations, right, end quotations, mainly under the pressure of the first national socialists, clamored for social reforms. One might almost say that the right came to represent the, in quotations, have-nots, end quotations, and the left, the, in quotations, haves, end quotation. While the conservatives distrusted the social revisionism and the radical mentality of national socialism, many workers found it attractive. Workers and artisans accounted for more than half of the membership of Zlasi's party. This proportion appears the more impressive if we consider that only 23% of the economically active Hungarian population was engaged in industry or mining. In other words, workers were heavily overrepresented in the Hungarian National Socialist Movement. The proportions that we can find in Germany at about the same time are not nearly so impressive, but they still run contrary to the interpretation of Nazism as a reactionary movement. The statistics for 1930, in brackets before the Nazi party came to power, end brackets, show a little over 28% of the party membership to be industrial workers. The inquiry of an American sociologist, in brackets, Theodore Abel, Why Hitler Came into Power, New York, 1938, end brackets, concerning 124 party members who had joined between 1925 and 1927, found 44% of these to have been skilled and unskilled workers, and 7% as coming from socialist or communist backgrounds. In quotations, at the time of joining, end quotations, adds Professor Abel, in quotations, only 9% were unemployed or in economic difficulties. The rest had secure positions, end quotation. It was in 1934 that Abel set out to inquire into the reasons that different Nazis had had, in brackets, or were prepared to give, end brackets, for joining the party. He found a significant proportion of working men who liked its promise of a new social order. Many people with social concern, many of whom were workers, had always rejected the doctrine of class struggle, or accepted it only superficially. Others found themselves repelled by internationalistic and anti-national appeals which placed a vague theory of working-class solidarity above the national and group solidarities they could understand, solidarities which the war had emphasized. Such feelings found expression in the position the National Socialists adopted. A coal miner was, in quotations, puzzled by the denial of race and nation implicit in Marxism. Though I was interested in the betterment of the working man's plight, I rejected, in brackets, Marxism, end brackets, unconditionally. I often asked myself why socialism had to be tied up with internationalism, why it could not work as well or better in conjunction with nationalism, end quotation. An old railroad worker said the same thing, in quotations, I shuddered at the thought of Germany in the grip of Bolshevism. The slogan, workers of the world unite, made no sense to me. At the same time, however, national socialism, with its promise of a community of blood, barring all class struggle, attracted me profoundly. End quotation. And a worker in industry welcomed in the Nazi party. In quotations, the uncompromising will to stamp out the class struggle, snobberies of caste and party hatreds, the movement bore the true message of socialism to the German working man. End quotations. As mentioned before, the war had played its part in re-emphasizing a national consciousness which the 19th century had created or inculcated, but which the industrial struggles of the same period had greatly weakened especially by the turn of the century. By 1918, in quotations, United we stand, divided we fall, end quotations, had acquired more sense than it had had for a long time, and the pragmatic basis for unity had become more apparent in the trenches than it could ever have become from books or courses in civics.
Abel's study quotes many expressions of nostalgia for frontline unity. In quotations, the war had taught us one lesson, the great community of the front. All class differences disappeared under its spell. There was only one people, no individuals. Common suffering and a common peril had welded us all together. End quotation. Even those who were not workers or petty bourgeois were affected by this new sense of what the national community implied and, above all, by the rejection of class distinctions, which were selfish, divisive, corrupting, whoever emphasized them. Thus, a great many Nazis expressed their dislike of conservatives, big landowners who cared only for the antediluvian setup in which they thrived, industrialists who were afraid of socialization, and the German National Party, the great conservative party representing all these. They did not like, in quotations, the spirit of caste and class, end quotations, one said. In quotations, the gentlemen were ready enough to be Germans and nationalists, but they lacked the courage for socialism, end quotation. Another Nazi, who had been an active member and organizer of the National Party, left it for the same reason, finding that it did not care about the millions of unemployed, but only about the economic interests of its overstuffed members. A sometimes militant of the subversive youth movement called the Werewolves was sickened by the class prejudice of conservative circles. Germany and the German people could only be revivified through the union of all the Germans, but the conservative nationalists did not seem to care. In quotations, reactionary circles were well aware that we were fighting for a nationalistic Germany. Still, they continually excluded working men from the national community. End quotation. So, he turned against them. And a Free Corps volunteer, who had fought the Bolsheviks in the East, very soon realized upon returning home that he and his friends had little in common with the so-called nationalists, who, in quotations, spoke of Germany but meant money and privilege, end quotation. He discovered an obscure party that called itself the German Social Party, in quotations, it was German, of course, German, patriotic, nationalistic, that was what we were, and so were the gentlemen with whom we could not agree, but there was another word that aroused our enthusiasm. Socialism. Enlightenment. The development of the communal spirit. We sensed and we knew that if we succeeded in animating these printed words, if we could unite the concepts of nationalism and socialism, we would have a banner under which we could lead the German people to freedom. End quotation. In Romania, Cadrenu and his friends had much the same impression. No one, wrote Cadrenu, not even a worker or a peasant, had the right to pursue his right or his due at the expense of national unity. In quotations, But we also refuse to admit that in the shelter of tricolor formulas, an oligarchical and tyrannous class should install itself on the backs of the workers and literally skin them alive, whilst it intones endless appeals to the fatherland it does not love, to God in whom it does not believe, to the church where it never sets foot, to the army which it sends into war with empty hands. There are realities which cannot serve as emblems for political swindles in the hands of immoral political conjurers. End quotation. In brackets, see reading number 4a. End brackets. Romania and Hungary did not have a very politically conscious electorate, but Germany did. An important proportion of this public was made up of nationalists whose social concern prevented them from accepting the privileges of the conservatives and of collectivists whose national sentiments opposed them to Marxist internationalism. These two powerful currents existed before Hitler and were independent of his movement. As the Free Corps volunteer told Abel, why not unite nationalism and socialism? As the coal miner said, why should not socialism work better in conjunction with nationalism? Patriotic feelings demanded and commanded national unity. Ideas of social justice found exploitation, economic inequalities, the caste spirit reprehensible. Wartime experience suggested a very concrete kind of brotherhood, which had seldom been realized before. Manoy Lescu was to write that, in quotations, social service is the source of every right, end quotation, and that a man deserved a political importance proportionate to his social, cultural, or economic function. That is, to his national function. At a simpler level, many fascists and national socialists would agree with the Nazi factory worker who had been a socialist, because, he said, in quotations, it seemed to me no more than proper that anyone who had unstintingly devoted himself to the fatherland should be entitled to share its wealth, end quotations. 
The man who expressed these feelings was going back, unbeknownst to himself, to the very sources of organic nationalist doctrine in the thinking of French and German revolutionaries of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. From these feelings, it would appear that neither the petty bourgeois nor the working-class supporters of National Socialism thought of it as a movement of reaction. Reformism or Reaction The equation between petty bourgeoisie and reaction raises a more serious question. However, by the implication that an exclusive identification with the industrial working class distinguishes the party of progress. It is possible to argue in purely Marxist terms that in underdeveloped societies, such as Hungary and Romania, the petty bourgeoisie was a temporary representative of progress. Leaving this aside, the fact remains that in most countries, economic and social progress has tended to turn the sometime proletarian into a small property owner. While many small producers and businessmen are eliminated by modern economic developments, others find in them the reason of their being. And the factory worker with a house, garden, and car, or the possibility of acquiring them, is as much of a petty bourgeois as Mr. Kipps. In such circumstances, accepted political classifications like right and left lose their meaning. Most people between the wars would have agreed with George Valois that basically the right was static and the left dynamic. But, communism apart, no movement of the time could match the dynamism of fascist leagues. In 1931, Jacques Geyser, a leading figure of the French Radical Socialist Party, defined the typical left-winger as a man who seeks solutions of an internationalist nature, defends collective rights against particular interests, does not consider that present needs can be answered by the status quo, and does not regard the existing property system as the legitimate foundation of social order. All but the first of these traits apply perfectly to the fascist militant and, within two or three years, the in quotations, left, end quotations, too had abandoned its internationalism. Kaiser equated the left with evolution, protest, and movement. There was little there that a revolutionary of the right would not claim for himself. And just because the classic representatives of such reputedly left-wing values failed to act upon their professed beliefs and failed to adapt them to the movement's needs, the fascists found a public to attract, the very public that socialism had lost. The petty bourgeoisie of labor, the declining middle classes, the rural smallholders, the agricultural laborers, were all largely ignored by conventional parties and doctrines. Neither liberalism nor conservatism, neither social democracy nor traditionalist reaction, responded to the issues and the needs of these sections of the public. It was to answer these needs, or to speculate upon them, that many fascist leaders first broke away, Mosley from labor, de Grel from the Belgian Catholic movement, Diot from Socialism, Doreau from Communism. Over a score of deputies left the French Socialist Party, in brackets SFIO, French Section of the Workers International, end brackets, in 1933, arguing that social democracy no longer suited an age where strong and independent executive power alone, based on a reconciled, united, disciplined nation, could tackle the moral and economic crisis. This had also been the gist of Mosley's case in the manifesto he had published on December 8, 1930. And, on May 21, 1934, speaking to the Congress of the new Parti Socialiste de France, Marcel Dia would argue that the word nation now carried more revolutionary overtones than any old-fashioned class slogan. This was especially true when it was used as the Germans used it, in terms like Volksgemeinschaft, meaning, in quotations, the community of the United Nation, end quotations, envisaged as a classless and socially integrated state where surviving social and economic inequalities would gradually disappear in a new order. In this new order, the role of the state would be crucial, not only as the representative of the national will, but also the vehicle of revolution. In quotations, it is no longer by revolution that one can attain power, end quotation. Henri de Man told an audience at the Sorbonne. In quotations, it is by power that we can realize the revolution. End quotations. For this, a strong state was necessary. Socialists realized this as well as fascists. De Man's, in quotations, theses of Potigny, end quotations, in brackets, September 1934, end brackets, were inspired by authoritarian and corporatist principles that opposed the traditional concepts of social democracy.
they called for a break with the doctrine of the separation of powers, in quotations, dear to the heart of bourgeois democracy, end quotations, and for a regime where, in quotations, the executive governs and representative institutions control, end quotations. In an organic society, the separation of powers makes no sense, but when executive governs in the total sense in which demand uses the term, there is little that representative institutions can do to assert their control. In Germany and Italy, in Vichy France, and, later, in the Fifth Republic, just as under Napoleon's rule, representative bodies would serve a symbolic and decorative function, not an organic one. But if the state is all, and the, in quotations, representative, end quotations, bodies politically insignificant, private interests are hardly more effective. Property remains free in direct relation to its social insignificance but it is manipulated as soon as its existence becomes relevant to public policy. This means that large-scale industrial and money interests will be the first affected. In fascist Italy and in Nazi Germany, although property was not attacked, its freedom of action was nibbled away, its independence gradually restricted, and its status altered. On August 5, 1932, Mosley's black shirt quoted Mussolini with approval, in quotations, under fascism, the capitalists will do what they are told and will go on doing what they are told until the end. End quotations. By their control of labor, credit, and taxation, fascists and Nazis tighten their grip on their country's economies. True, the directors of state boards of control were often chosen from the ranks of industrial and financial leaders. But while these leaders may have acted as representatives of their class and caste, they represented, above all, the technocracy, the managerial class whose rise had been a characteristic of our time. Whether their positions are in the public or private sector, these managers seem to act above all as specialists, whose personal interests are tied less to ideas of profit and loss than to criteria of achievement in which immediate gain may be irrelevant. Men like these can pass without difficulty from the private to the public sector, distinguish themselves by liquidating a factory or a coal mining area as easily as by augmenting its productivity, and pass on to the next assignment. We see them at work today in the mixed economy of the United States, or the common market, as in the state capitalist economy of the Soviet bloc. They are the creatures of the great industrial concentrations of our time, but hardly their servants. Here again, the national collectivism of fascists and national socialists inclines them to view old-fashioned industrial and capitalistic interests with suspicion. Their feeling of being besieged, their insistence on national self-sufficiency, while they may bring profits to national industry, go counter to the cosmopolitan tendencies of large-scale money powers. Against anarchic, individualistic, or monopolistic capitalism, the theoreticians of nationalism and of Marxism, the prejudices of proletarians, petty bourgeois, and conservatives coalesce. Their widely divergent interests are reconciled in opposition on the basis of a common nationalism. The fact that for some this nationalism is conservative and for others collectivistic is generally and conveniently ignored, so long as the coalition lasts. But such coalitions do not last long. Temporary alliances between radicals, conservatives, and reactionaries can hold together only under extremely critical conditions, during a time of crisis. The crisis passed, the fever abated, such alliances are bound to fall apart, with the consequent sacrifice of the weaker partners. In Spain and in Romania, the revolutionaries of the right were neutralized by their conservative competitors. In Germany and Italy, as fascists and national socialists settled into power, the conservatives were edged back and gradually removed from positions where they might have exercised an influence on policy or on the economy. Results were unpleasant in either case. In Spain, the representatives of established order did not hesitate to use the fascist bands to do their dirty work. Mercenaries of a bourgeois order, which they detested and which detested them, the fascists felt exasperation mount at the thought that they were preserving not only the interests, but also the good conscience of the conservatives. Where the forces of conservative moved in time, as Franco did in Spain, this exasperation did not have time to explode. The phalange was broken and harnessed to the conservative dictator's orders. Failing that, an explosion, such as occurred in Romania in 1941, might lead to massacres ending in defeat and dissolution for the revolutionary insurrectionists. In the opposite case, however, where the forces of fascism gained the upper hand, their revolutionary pretensions gave way to opportunistic maneuvers 
and high purpose yielded to corruption and parasitism, defended by terror and force. The elevation of the end had justified the basest means. In turn, the means would mark the end. The violence, glorified as a necessary part of national revivification, would sink to brutality. Organicist dogma would justify the constraint or elimination of dissenters. The leader cult ended in paranoic exclusivism, and the chivalry of the elite turned into a core of torturers and butchers. Strange paradox of dreams that turned into nightmare, the fascist phenomenon leaves us with the question, as yet unresolved, at what point and under just what pressures do high ideals turn into tales of dread?